Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Internet Herald podcast. Today, we got ourselves a special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hey, everyone. I'm Basil. Um, I'm, a, I'm a senior university student at University of Alberta. Um, and my major is math and physics, but my interests are pretty much uh, in much broader area, actually. I mean, even though I'm a student of science, I'm interested in history, politics, and basically everything. You're, you're pure academics. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, what, what, what? I guess, what caused you to have like an interest in like so many academic fields, and really, I suppose, in the methodology of academics. Right. So, I, I basically grew up in an environment of academia. Like my both my dad and my grandfather are physicists, um, and especially uh, like spending my childhood with my grandfather, he encouraged me a lot in learning. Just not about like basically everything. Like we discuss history. I mean, as a as a seven, eight year old child, we still discuss and debated history and politics and physics and whatnot. So that basically grew up on me. Right, fair, fair. So right now you're obviously you're studying physics, just like your your parents and your grandparents. So w- what exactly are you studying in the field of physics? Uh, my. Uh, first, I'm an undergraduate, so I still don't have yeah, a yeah. very like concentrated area in which I right, do my right. work. But mm-hmm. uh, basically, I work in a field of mathematical physics, uh, which is basically uh, which basically deals with how to apply pure mathematical tools in solving problems in physics. So whenever you see like cool new physics stuff coming up, coming on, and like basic crazy theories in string theory and black holes and wormholes and whatnot. These are from these are basically done by mathematical physicists because they are the people who are solving equations, and then going on PBS FaceTime to tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> so should should we expect to see you on PBS soon, eventually? <laughs> um, <hopefully>. Not anytime <laughs> <Hopefully>. soon though. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So, all right, how about this then? Why don't you give us like an interesting theory or maybe a crazy theory that you know of right now in the field, which perhaps is not mainstream yet. Um, I'd say, okay, first of all, I, I definitely don't have a very deep understanding of anything that I'll tell you about because, of course, I'm a pretty noob myself in right, this field. Right. But, I mean, th- this, is, this might be mainstream in popular culture from, like, YouTube videos and all that, but this particular thing, which I'm going to tell you about, is not mainstream in the physics community yet, and that is string theory. Okay. Uh, string theory bases uh, one of the biggest open questions in physics right now is how to unite the theory of gravity and the theory of uh, quantum mechanics. So from quantum mechanics, I mean theory of small particles, microscopic world of subatomic and subat- subatomic particles, elementary particles. So how to basically combine the theory of very big with the theory of very small, um, because Even though these two things are part of the same universe, the basic guiding principles in physics which we are using to to study them are actually not compatible with each other. Uh, Because for for gravity and gravitational forces to study the universe, we are our most uh, favorable tool to use right now and which more advanced and tool is uh, is the general theory of relativity given by Einstein. while the theory of quantum mechanics, uh, which which uh, which basically developed around like the start of uh, 20th century by actually by works of many physicists, and basically uh, and increased up to like uh, like 1960s and 50s by Richard Feynman and all that, those people, that theory, these two theories work on completely different mathematical principles and completely different ideas, and when we try to put them together, they basically collapse. We cannot. Put them together because because basically uh, idea of um, the, like, the theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity, is saying that space like gravity is not actually a force in the sense we think about it. It's actually just a result of curvature of space and time. So space time is like basically one fabric. They are not separate. They're like one big like bed sheet. 
in in four dimensions, uh, which are which are spread across the universe. Um, and and when when, and when basically when you put something with a mass in, into that bed sheet, it basically curves it. As you whenever you if you stretch a bed sheet and put a ball on it, it curves it. In the same way, it curves the space time. And the amount of curvature it causes in that fabric, the, the object, that the, the stronger the pull of the gravitational pull of that object would be. So the heavier is the object, the stronger it pulls. So that's how that, that's a basic governing principle of uh, theory of relativity, general theory of relativity of Einstein, which is basically which, which which revolves around Einstein's field equation, tends a very interesting tensor equation. Well, the theory of quantum mechanics is, I mean, in, 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 in the first glance, it's centered around something called a Schrodinger equation, um, but 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 that's actually a pretty elementary understanding of quantum mechanics. And but when you study like more advanced stuff, more more heavy stuff, you don't generally take that formulation of quantum mechanics. You go with alternate. For example, the most common is I think Richard Feynman's path integral approach. Um, so what's what's that path integral approach? Path integral approach is basically a, one of the formulation of quantum mechanics. It's basically a new mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics using Lagrangian principle. So, uh, so, so the, and so the Schrodinger equation is is based on a on a formulation of physics we call Hamiltonian principle, in okay. which so a Hamiltonian is basically uh, an equation you can say it's not exactly an equation but you can call it an equation in which you take the kinetic energy. And the potential energy, and you sum them. So K okay, plus B, and yep. then basically work with that. In Lagrangian formulation, basically, um, okay. So this, uh, what I'm going to tell you, is not the Lagrangian which we use in quantum mechanics because it's a little bit different. But at least in classical mechanics, when we use a Lagrangian uh, principles, we basically take an equation in which we take the kinetic energy and the potential energy and subtract them. So it's a difference of both of them. Um, but but in, in quantum mechanics, but in a path integral formulation, it's actually not not that equation that we use in Lagrange principle because the Lagrange principle is based around a much broader uh, field of mathematics, which we call the fun uh, functionals and functional uh, functional equations. So basically, Lagrange is the functional of action. It's an integral uh, of action. My action is in a new quantity. So uh, so yeah, so that that's basically the formulation we use to study, so, to basically uh, come up with the path integral formulation. Interestingly, <laughs> Richard Feynman, uh, Richard Feynman was the person who actually devised the formulation of basically work, uh, came up with this approach to quantum mechanics and basically worked like developed it in the sense how we see it today. Interestingly, mm -hmm. mathematicians haven't still been able to catch up with that. So they still could not come up with a solid mathematical theory to explain what path integrals are. So it's just physicists. So <laughs> this is an interesting thing that happens in physics. So physicists are generally the people who come up with new mathematics, and then mathematicians catch up with that by like rigorizing it, right? Physicists are like, oh, see, we can just take this curve and uh, make small rectangles and add them and get the integral and take the derivatives and all that. And then mathematicians come in and say, oh no, we should not talk about it like that. We should like formalize it and rigorize it and use epsilon delta definition and whatnot to make proofs and all that. So that's right, right. done later. For example, when, when calculus first came about, when Newton invented calculus, it was a very sloppy theory. I mean, it just did not have like a re any real solid mathematical foundation. He was just like using intuition, his drawing to explain mathematical concept. But if you see, if you see it as a mathematical lens, basically what he was doing was dividing by zero, which is not allowed. Uh, so, 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 math, so a, a, a correct, a full theory of calculus uh, as a pure mathematical theory didn't come about until like 18th, uh, 18th, 19th and 18th century, which is like 200 years after right, right. Newton's death. So, so on that, right, on the theory of calculus, right, so basically, so what I've read, right, from my research in, in, into history, and I know you said you're interested in history, is mm -hmm. that the Greeks... The Greeks and the Indians had, you know, basically formulated calculus before that, right? Uh, so, do you know was their calculus, I suppose, as advanced as, say, like you know, two hundred years after Newton, or was their calculus similar to what Newton was basically coming up with? It was more similar to what Newton was doing because okay, they were okay, still gotcha, using gotcha. The, their intuition, not mathematical right, tools. Right. So, more qualitative methods. And more qualitative, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Go on. Go on. Continue. <laughs> um, so. 
so yeah i mean so 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 when when newton invented calculus to basically explain his physics because he was he developed calculus to explain his theory of gravitation which he was developing he needed a math new mathematical tool to solve those problems so he invented calculus to do that but after newton's death for approximately 200 years calculus was was not very popular among in mathematical circles because they were mathematicians were like it's a very dangerous domain to work in because we don't have an explanation of a lot of things going on here so uh, I actually I I, could, I cannot recall the names right now, but there are a few mathematicians who actually explicitly wrote against calculus because of that. Really? Uh, um, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very 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 cheesy stuff about calculus. No no no, it's it, it's interesting <laughs> to see because like calculus today is like the foundation of so many things, right? Right. Like, basically, you learn calculus while you're in high school for a reason, mm -hmm. right? Right. So that's the thing because because all the problems we solve with calculus. You can't solve without calculus. I mean, not all of them, but most of them, at least. You can't solve them without calculus, but they will be like a big, like headache for you. I mean, you, yeah, like what, what, what could be done in like two-line computation with calculus, which might take like five pages of long calculations to do without calculus. So yeah, calculus was a very, very. I mean, in my opinion, it was the greatest contribution of physics to mathematics. I would say. Um, I mean, the, our whole modern understanding of mathematics is based around calculus nowadays. Not all, all I mean, approximately all of them, not right, right, yeah. totally all of them, but yeah, mm, you can say that. Right. Is, there, is there a revolution coming, just like calculus, from physics into math? Uh, I don't think, no, right now, no, it's pretty, it's pretty, it has gone to a very stable level right now. It hasn't, there ha I don't see anything very revolutionary coming around in like, at least in right, I mean, right. decades at least. Right. So, for example, right, you brought up right the Newtonian laws, uh, like Newtonian laws of gravity, right, motion, so on and so forth, right. Mm -hmm. So, I think we were discussing this earlier. We were discussing for the last few days because I've been kind of obsessed with this one guy named Granat, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, and and the Vaisheshika Sutra because it's it's it's, it's something which is written in like six hundred somewhere between six hundred two hundred BCE, right, okay. which is probably when uh Rishi Granat lived in uh, ancient India, and. Basically, in the Vaishya Sutra, right, from the research that we have done and from, you know, looking at research of other other people uh, and also reading the Vaishya Sutra itself uh, and looking at the translations we have, basically, like, we see the Newtonian laws of motion uh, and also, like, the impulse formula and the concept of gravity um, and also atomic theory <laughs> in, in, in Karnad's work. So, like... I guess, what are your thoughts on that, right? Because, like, I, I understand Karnad is not, like, a, he's not really a scientist. He's more of a natural philosopher, right? He's using both qualitative and quantitative methods. But, like you said, like, even Newton is using certain qualitative methods, right? right so, like, right. what, yeah, so, like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, when we see, like, all, like Newton's law, for example, or, like, Galilean relativity, uh, like, the relative motion and all that theory that came in physics around like 15, 1600s, right? Yeah. If you really study them in their true forms, they are they are, they are very like uh, very easy observations in some senses, right? You you see them, you you but you just don't observe them. You see them right, happening sure. around you. What those people did was to observe it. And and come up with a with a rule. I mean, uh, come, basically wrote their observation in a in a in a more scientific way in in, in a way, uh, right? So so what Galileo did, what Newton did. Of course, they, after that came fancy mathematics explaining it. That's something later on. But in their true sense, like Newton's first law is like one liner. Uh, Newton's second law is like one liner. Newton's third law is like literally like four or five words. Uh, so, so that's what basically those people back then were also doing. They didn't have those mathematical tools we have here, but they have a brain or the observation. They did. They made all those observations, and they and they wrote in whatever best, what best of their ability, right? Whatever, whatever, whatever tools they had available, they wrote in it. Right, right. Um, and so it's not really surprising that they, those people were writing those kind of things so back, like long, long ago, because. I mean, there, there hasn't been a very, like, sharp increase in, like, human brain, right? I mean, evolution-wise, like, human brain, like, 2,000, 3,000 years ago is same the human brain which exists today. But we still, but just that we have much more information now to store in it. But development-wise, 
I think what the brain that Rishi Kanad had, Kanad had is probably the brain that Newton and Galileo have. Right, um, right. But still, like, it's, it's fascinating because, like, this is even before, like, you know, this is even before the Buddha is born. You know right, what I mean? Right, right. Like, right. this is ancient, ancient history. Right. But this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is also, uh, this, yeah, I think, like, one of the other factors during his time, difference between his time and Newton's and Galileo's time is also, like, their, their so, social cultural backgrounds, right? Right, so right. So back then, like, when, when Kanad was working, no one was really, I mean, worried about, quantifying universe and, <laughs> and, and, right. and doing anything. People were, I mean, first of all, people I mean, mo- most food. people, like 90% of population was basically thinking how to survive, like how to get by the other day. And in like very elite circles in, in like King's courts or like among like big scholars, I think the main concern was more of like religious concerns about their theology and everything. No one was really concerned about what the stuff is made out of. Right. 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 So and state building, military, so and so forth. Yeah, right, that was right. the main concern. So right. so I mean ninety percent of the population is just trying to get by and other like maybe like one percent of the population is just thinking about how like how to how state how, how to tax <laughs> people, how to how to make military <laughs> right, right. work, and even like maybe like some rishis or like some say they're still thinking about how how to interpret like the Rig Veda or like Veda or what what Upanishads means, all that debate about that. No one was really thinking about. No one like the, back then, at least in India, there was no I think a big encouragement for uh, like sci- scientific development right, uh, right. In, in, in in a way that Karad. I mean, did it, did it. Th- there was, but maybe not to the same extent. Right? Like it was same. very minor, very yeah, minor. It was very minor, and it, it, it was India, the big country, right? Right. So if, it's if, really if, a subcontinent we're talking about here, not yeah, just like yeah, the country yeah. itself, it's, it's right? Yeah, it's a bit. It's, it's also a big country, subcontinent, right, right. country, whatever you want to call it, in like right. area sense. Right. So exactly. now we think, in a sense, oh, like if we say that maybe like a Rishi one was working on this thing and Rishi two was working on this thing in the same time in India. And then we think, oh, like three or four people were working on, on the scientific problems together. So that must be like a scientific period for them. That's not necessarily true because just because of their isolation, they probably did not even <laughs> know about each other that they were working, right? right? Or, so or perhaps that, by the find that by the time like that information gets from one end to the other, right? That the progress is completely changed and the dynamics are completely yeah, different. That, that's that's all big possibilities. But I think the bigger possibility is they didn't even knew about each other that they were working on the same thing because. As you said, India was a subcontinent, and I mean, basically going up like from one kingdom to other kingdom was basically like traveling countries back yeah. then, right? So I mean, even even today, you can say going today, from one state today, to another. Even today, yeah. even though it's so connected now, uh, there's social, cultural, and political difference in like like even city to city. I would say not just state to yeah. state, city to city. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it, it might appear to our modern eyes with our modern understanding of how connected the world is that, oh, there are so many people working together on like working on the same similar kind of problems at the same time. They must have known about each other and they must have like collaborated or something. We, we get this like a uh, subconscious idea in our brain. We basically yeah, try to like, look, 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 look yeah. with the same lens as we see like scientific world today. But that's not right. necessarily true. They, they, they might. They, they, they were probably working very independently from each other mm-hmm. and that's something very remarkable about them that's something that that's that's right. a remarkable coincidence i would say yeah i agree and i mean they still like had certain like certain common knowledges right for example like veshishka which is ba- basically kanad's uh, kanad's work which which establishes the veshish sutra and the veshish sutra establishes the veshish darshana right within within uh, dharma right but basically like Veshishka emerges from from Nyai, right? So like Karnad would be considered like well, he would call himself basically a, a Nyayak uh, thinker or a Nyayak darshan, right? Which is basic, which is basically the the dharmic uh, school of of or dharmic darshan of logic and epistemology, right? So mm-hmm. like there's there are certain commonalities, but by the time these commonalities spread out, right, and and get to the entire subcontinent, it's been like probably several generations have passed, right? And and pro- different levels of progress have been made in different areas. Right, right, right. That, that 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 is true, and 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 knowledge also. Think about what, one more interesting thing about like, at least in India. I don't know about uh, any other places in the world that might, where it might happen, but I think the, the the societal background in India also affects this a lot because these people, 
were were basically like Karad or all, all his uh, all his colleagues. I mean, colleagues in the sense that people who follow the same school or follow the same right. kind of work work workspace around him. <laughs> Um, these were basically scholarly elites of that time, right? Right. And right. there was, and by and by that time, India was entering a phase of a pretty, uh, pretty strong social hierarchy based on caste system. Mm. Mm. Uh, so knowledge was only, so elite circles were basically the higher caste, right? Brahmins probably. So Brahmins were the people who were basically working. I mean- but but Karnad lived in like you know obviously like 600 BC but like the, the caste system doesn't really become like as prevalent yeah, until I, I would I, say the I, middle ages really yeah, yeah that's why I said it was starting to get into that phase right right, right. like the beginning the early this, stages yeah. right. there was still I mean there were like there were texts written like I mean like Manu Smriti which is very very bad uh, caste based discriminatory Contra- controversial <laughs> I mean text. yeah uh, and that was so I feel I feel that like the the Manu Smriti originally had a different intent. Than than what what it basically become maybe but but at least if you just see the language we can see the connotations right. used like basically dividing the caste society based mm. on caste what what each caste has to do like basically the mm. caste role but as, but then also within like the municipality for example right it talks about like how like individuals can start out in one caste but because based on their talent and based on their knowledge and pursuits they become another caste right so right. I feel like I feel like it's almost like talking more about just like dividing the workplace I suppose or the divisions of work rather or, or looking at the observation of the divisions of work in society rather than like like okay this is hard like this is what you got to do no matter what because this is what you're born into i feel like that comes like as a later corruption of that idea but 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 you know that's the thing most was probably written around the time when this 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 all society societal structure was start, was starting to go in the wrong direction it, it hadn't mm. reached the same right like uh, like adverse form that it existed in Middle Ages, the the caste system, the bad caste system we know today, but it probably yeah. started to get. Like, there was some sense of it, right? Yeah. And 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 one more thing about like uh, societal uh, or like cultural background about in India was that everything was probably looked like even scientific things were looked with more of like a like religious uh, lens, mm. right? Uh, so when when like when Karnad or any other person wrote something scientific like about Adam or whatever, like in Sanskrit, these were seen as some kind of like more religious. So they, they were read as shlokas, right? So, so rather th- than religious, would you say perhaps maybe more spiritual? Spiritual, sorry. Yeah, I think yeah. spiritual is a better word. Religi- because when we think about religion today, we think about it in modern religious right. sense. Yeah, spiritual. More spiritual and more... So this was one of the major difference between, like I think, like the classical Greek world and like the Eastern world, right? The both mm, of... But- Right, right, but here's the thing, right? So this is this is kind of where I disagree with. I think, at least with like I think with Karnat, I, I agree that there was probably elements of spirituality, mm-hmm. but I also feel like something like the Veshishks, right, and the Nyayaks, I feel like they were more non-theist than say, um, you know, than say theist or atheist or right, like right. even like yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's totally fine. That's totally fine. I'm not talking about them actually. I'm not talking about mm. what they were doing, but what came later on, like what did oh, okay, okay, okay. Right, right. eventually evolved into. Gotcha, what, gotcha. Yeah, what what happened after 200, 300 years after they died? What mm. happened to whatever their ideas? They transformed right. more from into a scientific and logical thing into a more like a spiritual, a spiritual thing, right? Thing. Like right, right. shlokas and some kind of like scriptures or something, right? Mm. Uh, while in Greek world, at least what I was I have seen, like mathematics and proofs and logic remain mathematics and proof and logic. They didn't become something to do with religion. Mm. Uh, I mean, but even those also, those right. Greek mathematicians were pretty religious people themselves, but they kind of separated it from their world. I, I feel that also we we never really got to see like you know the I guess the, the long term uh, evolution of the Greek culture, right? Like the Greece, like the ancient Greek as we know them, right? kind of like they become a first but they become romanized which is fine but then after basically after the fall of rome right or you not even fall of rome but during roman times right like there's a significant shift in 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 the greek culture right and then eventually get you know the byzantines which are basically and even before the byzantines right with constantine you effectively get a more christianized greece yeah yeah, and, yeah. right and a lot of these things like i guess change <sighs> significantly like, like you know what i mean like we can't fully observe right, what that right. evolution would have been because I feel like at least with some of the stuff, right? Like, like for example, when you when you read the dialogues of Plato, right? Like, even though I feel I, I strongly think that those dialogues are non-theist, I still feel like some of some of the stuff is almost bordering on what may be called like 
semi spirituality if that makes sense right right and, and i totally agree with that i mean those people those plato socrates and whatever they these were not non theist people they they were pretty religious people they, yeah, yeah. they strongly believed in their like what, whatever religious background they had jupiter and back, back in that <laughs> or zeus right? yeah. zeus and like their greek pantheon they of course had that and they inferred that sometimes in their philosophy but mm. they never like like change their focus from of the philosophy i mean they included it but as like like maybe as a reference not as mm. kind of centerpiece right mm. um and this did like i know i'm also not saying that this happened in india what i mean right. because in, in in india actually like indian spirituality was much more complex than the greek spirituality they were basically mm. they had a very weird they, i mean their philosophy I mean, but, was not philosophic like their religious right. philosophy was not philosophical at all and i like, mean but that's india. the thing like we don't we don't fully like how, how can we fully say that right like you know what i mean Like it's difficult to say that because like I right, bet some of the stuff is yeah, of course, of right, course. They, right. they, we don't have any research but from whatever we can infer I mean we still we have pretty strong evidences from their archaeology and from whatever writing we have found we we, we could pretty, pretty we right. have pretty much created a lot uh, a lot of their ancient religious beliefs at least for Greeks at least because they left a lot of things and from whatever we could have we have reconstructed whatever we have found uh we i i can i can pretty easily say that they didn't have a very complex spiritual mm. system or religious the, theological system as we had back here in india i mean uh, but, but but aren't like some of these greek gods behaving so much so like humans in some of these myths like for example like the iliad the odyssey like i, I don't know perhaps it's not like as like you said as exactly like india but i feel like the complexity is more of a emotive uh, complexity what am i say that actually this is this is what i'm saying yeah. so their gods are more humanly right they they are, mm. they are like they're doing human stuff right. uh, I, i don't want to go into nsfw part but you know, <laughs> a, a lot of yeah, people yeah, people know what what's going on in the theology right <laughs> yeah. but while in india even though we had like it started initially in rigveda or like vedas the story started as god being some kind of more humanly things but later on in philosophy it evolved in much more complex debates right what is the nature mm, of right. god what is the right. yeah. what, what is the nature of divinity right in right. upanishads right. or like even even in the later stories there were more morality more lessons more philosophy in those stories than compared to like iliad mm. which which has some very sure. questionable mo- morality <laughs> going on there um <laughs> or the odyssey odyssey I mean, of course <laughs> or, uh, all, all or w- what was the the opened the uh, opening uh, Oedipus, the series of Oedipus. Oedipus. yeah uh, yeah <laughs> yeah <Oedipus X. laughs> uh, they have some very oh, questionable man. things going on there and and from reading them it doesn't seem that this is supposed to be kind of like a pondering point this is just a story i mean w- w- when you read text you can you can realize what is the intention of the author does it mean mm-hmm. that does it mean it to be like more of a think about it or just... but then again like unless you're able to read greek right unless you're able to read that language itself like like c- can you truly infer like the each of the double meanings and like the entendres and the right. the, the, I, like, I the can, I, I of right. course can and i'm saying all whatever i'm saying based on my secondary reading right. my reading right. of either interpretations or whatever scholars who know greek have read mm. and understood right. from it from all of it of course i i i, I have i yeah. haven't person look into the primary right. source itself right of course and like the thing is like cuz i feel like even even if you were to look at the primary source right unless you're living in that culture right unless you're living in the ancient greece itself like how do you not know like for example say if they use the word i don't know like word goat right like how do we know that the word goat just means goat mm-hmm. to them right how do we know not know that it means it could pr- possibly be a joke or possibly be you know right. um right a, a, a symbol meaning something completely else right within right. within this within that small little village or something like mm-hmm. that right So but I understand like what you were just saying cuz like also you know with Greece because it, their culture is kind of you know almost changed significantly by a lot of external forces uh, and I think there was more of a preservance of like the origin not, maybe not the original culture per se but elements of it in India that they were they were it, it created more of a more gave them more time to develop more complexities right. granted granted right like right. most <laughs> most, myth- most mythological traditions are kind of in a sense like at least from, from like from the outside looking in it looks very simple but like i can i i have a feeling that if someone was had never like seen if india had just died as a culture right like mm-hmm. hinduism and then then they were to look at our mythologies right i feel like they might be able to get some of the complexity right but for example like if you were to reconstruct the entire mahabharat based off like pottery 
right? Which is basically what we did with the Iliad of the Odyssey, where we, right, we, there's no text. So we kind of just looked around for different evidences and constructed the story, right? Like if you were to construct, do the same thing with the Mahabharata, can you create something as complex? Probably not. Probably not, yeah. And, right. and then you lose so much of it, then suddenly it looks more like, oh, well, this... This is not as philosophically, you know, intense as like Hegel. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, also, one more interesting about India was, as you one, one thing you just mentioned, that Indians got a lot of like time and space around them to think and work, right? Because right, right. these Greeks were constantly involved in some one or other con one I mean, or other conflict, it, right? If Sparta one is Persian one of their cities, Empire, but... <laughs> one with barbarians, one with Romans, one right. with Egyptians, and whatnot, right? And, and with each other, like, with each other, yeah. with, with each other, right? And, and and something was always going on with them. They didn't right. have a, like a peace of mind ever. And I it was mean, it was a much more focused what? area, right? Because like India had those problems, but India was so spread out. Like while Greece is just like so focused yeah, in the mountains, yeah. like on India the coast. Spread out, but also India back then at least didn't have so much of a problem. I mean, if you, if you read mm. Indian history in classical era, at least in BC era, there's yeah. not a lot really intense wars going on, right? There right, were like right. kingdoms pretty stable, uh, big kingdoms who were basically... Even, even like Mahajan were, like, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even if they were fighting, they were like minor skirmishes among each other, right? There was no yeah. foreign power coming in and sweeping the whole po socio-political system in the country, right? right. Uh, like, yeah, just like maybe in certain regions, but not the full Yeah, like thing. maybe in right, frontier yeah. provinces in like in the West. Uh, but at right, least... Yeah, like where, modern where, Afghanistan and stuff. Yeah, yeah. whatever... Ha because all these things, all these people we read about like Kanad or whatever, like these, all these regions, they, feel, they came mostly from like the... What we call like the, the north, heartland. The heartland of like the Ganges yeah. Plains and this area, or either South India. Mm, I, I, yeah. I, I, the, the, those places which were stable places in right. some, in, right. compared to like frontier provinces in like like western like modern day western Pakistan or like Afghanistan as, as you say. Right. Yeah, these right. these were the first places to fall victim to anything. Uh, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, like real quick, I wanted to kind of go where. So this is this is a, a research paper I found. This is on uh, by the International Journal of Science and Engineering. Um, so. Anyway, some of the so this research paper kind of goes into the more the physics of Granada, and I feel like sharing with the audience and also getting your take as someone you know who studies physics, right? I think it's 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 quite interesting to see you know what what uh, might come out. So for uh, the basically the journal, right? We jump into like the an analysis of each slope. So taking from five one seven, so chapter five, first Ahinka slope seven, and then five two three. Um, basically, you kind of get their first like theory of gravity, if that makes sense. So basic, uh, so here's a translation of 517. In the non-presence of contact, the pestle falls due to its heaviness. Uh, translation of 523, water falls due to absence of contact and due to the process of its, uh, due to the presence of its heaviness. So these guys are, so that's basically like, and they, they call this, there's a word they use here, which is called Gurtwat, right? And then, which is a non-contact force which causes objects to fall due to their heaviness. So Gurutvat basically translates to gravity, right? So these guys are talking about gravity. And they also understand that weight, heaviness, weight has something to do with uh, gravity, right? Now, obviously, weight equals gravity times mass, uh -huh. right? Now, now we move on a little bit, right, to, to the theory of um, the, the theory of mo the laws of motions for, for Kanad. So the first law, you know, you compile with the, you know, chapter one, Ahinka one, Shloka 20, and then uh, 1, 121, and then 1, 116. So these three shlokas put together form basically uh, the first law of, of, of motion for Granad, which is um, uh, that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted by an unbalanced force. Right now, if you were to read uh, Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica Philosophia Naturalis in like you know 1686, his first law is every object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change its state by the action of an external force. This is basically <laughs> inertia, right? Um, and then the second law, which is you know, figured out using the shlokas 518, 519, and 5110, uh, basically gives you the impulse formula, which is force multiplied by t time equals mass multiplied by change in velocity which, you know, you can use to calculate for all of those things. Um, <laughs> and it's just insane, right? Um, and right, this, um, 
All right, give me a second. I'm trying to just uh, look around. So, and and then Newton's second law of motion, which it, which this is compared to, right, is basically um, that you know, which says that change of motion is proportional to the mo motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed, right? Again, like you kind of see the same the same concepts. Um, then you go to the third law of motion, right, which is um, basically taken from one single sutra, which is one one fourteen, which says. Uh, Karya Virodhi Karma, right? That basically means action is opposed by action. So, you know, the Newton's third law, right? The equal, each action is an equal and opposite reaction, right? We're seeing this once again in, as, you know, in, in uh, Veshish Sutra. Uh, so those are Newton's law. But then going on further into atomic theory, basically, our guy over here figures out that, right, if he, he realized just like the Greeks that there's something like an atom, right? A karna. In fact, the name Karnad means particle eater. His real name is Kashyap, but he decided to use the pseudonym, right, for this particular text for obvious reasons. And the Greeks thought about the atoms. So did this guy, right, as in this, like, this particle, which is like the building block for everything, right? And, but the thing is where he, this guy goes further, and I think you actually pointed this out to me earlier, was um, that basically he thinks of that the atom is made of two particles with mass and two particles without mass, right? And... He thinks that's what all of the atoms are. Now, obviously, that's what we would probably call a helium atom today, right? So the first model of a helium atom, one may say, right? And yes, it's not really done through a pure quantitative method. It's done probably through a qualitative and a quantitative method, right? So you're seeing, uh, right? So it's it's not like what you would say pure science, but it's so, it's like, you know, it's natural philosophy, but it's getting so close to it, right? And also the aid, like the model, right? It's the understanding of it is, is pretty accurate to what we have the understanding of today, right? Of how we think of electrons as almost massless particles and then the real mass of the atoms and the neutrons and the protons, right? And obviously now, I think I have a feeling that he pretty much got balancing confused and that's why he decided that they all need to, because he, you know, he realized that they need to be balanced, right? But I think if he had figured out balancing, he could have figured out like how different, you know, mole how molecules basically form and could have also fathered chemistry, but, but he did not. So for that reason, I mean, for all of those reasons, I think this guy is the father of physics. I think because he's able to explain these motions. Now, we know those laws of motions are wrong, right? That's why Einstein's general theory of relativity comes in and explains them better, right? And, and fixes the issues with Newtonian, um, Newtonian physics, right? Well, actually, the first three laws are not wrong. Those are correct. The only problem is the gravi really? law of gravitation. Those okay, are universal. Okay. Well, yeah. I did not know that. Uh, I did not. I thought those were the ones which were wrong, but they're not. No, no, okay, no. Hold the, the law which is wrong is F equals to G times M1, M2 over R squared. That's, mm -hmm. that's okay. not correct in the sense that it's just an approximation. It's not the exact thing right. that's going on. Uh, gotcha, going back gotcha. to whatever you spoke, uh, like first, first thing that I found very interesting was his uh, more more interesting than his other three like uh, variation like va variation of three laws. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, is 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 his is his uh, explanation of gravity because he okay. he explains gravity as a non-contact force, which is actually more of a non-Newtonian thing. It's not more actually of what Einstein said because Einstein said. Gravity is not really a force. There is no thing <laughs> pulling, or like there's no like invisible thing that is pulling things or stretching things. It's just the nature of space and time itself, right? The nat so the space and time is just like a big fabric, and when it curves, there's natural tendency of the body to move along that curve. So there's mm, no right. real contact force going on between the object and the object which is pulling. It's just the nature of the surrounding, the nature of the space time which is causing that object to move, right? So, which, hmm. so this is more of like a Einstein's way of looking rather than the Newtonian way of looking at gravity, which I found okay. very interesting. Wow. Um, secondly, coming back to so what you said about helium atom, I think from what I remember, what Karnad wrote was that every, uh, every uh, object was made of four kinds of atoms, basically, two of them with mass and two massless. So he didn't say that one atom had four particles, mm. two of them mass, uh, right. with mass and two of them massless, which would so, be, as you said, hydrogen, uh, sorry, helium atom. Right. So the reason I said that, because I think, at least from the text, which I, read, I think it's, it, he said that there's six elements which an atom can belong to. So there's six types of atoms. Right. And then within those atoms, like that, like then they describe the structure of the atom. 
I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, I think this particular part we got from um, an article written by uh, Shubhash. I'm trying to remember his name. Kund or Kund? Shubhash Kuk, I think. Yeah, Shubhash Kuk. Um, describing like the the two uh, particles with mass and the two particles without mass. And then, and then like he divides all the atoms up in these like six different elements of fire, water, earth, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Which obviously, you know, which he's he's of wrong course. about, right? He's wrong yeah, about yeah, the elements. Yeah. But well, you cannot can, can, you cannot get modern um, theory of atoms from right. Planck's text, right? You cannot expect yeah, that right. level of uh, you, you cannot do that level of scrutiny mm-hmm. <laughs> with this text to be, uh, of course, uh, right. on it because I mean, this like what twenty six hundred to two hundred BC, yeah. 2600 years old approximately <laughs> old stuff um yeah so yeah yeah but but in in a sense if we look in, in, in the more broader lens of and uh, with more understanding of his background and his time it's pretty remarkable yeah hmm. so from that like so a lot of times when i ask this question i know we kind of went over this right like people talk about like how did this information not spread i guess as well throughout throughout humanity like why did it take for example, why was calculus invented three times, right? Or more than three times? Like, why was something like this, which is, we, you know, we, we were figuring out back then, why didn't it, you know, because the thing is, like, the Veshishk persisted, right? Like, the school of Veshishk was still around, like, uh, hundreds of years after Karnad, right? And this is the founded document for Veshishk, right? So why, why is it that, you know, even, even though these schools existed for several hundreds of years across a, a pretty large geographical area, why weren't these ideas able to, I guess, propagate and spread more throughout throughout humanity not just in india but also in other cultures and you know and the ideas which other other cultures would have thought of uh why is it that um it took something like i guess you know why what conditions did seven you know 1700s europe or 1600s europe reached renaissance europe really reached that <laughs> it was able to you know these ideas were able to basically create a revolution uh you know the scientific revolution the enlightenment you know, right um so on and so forth and eventually into the industrial revolution and then the age of imperialism you know imperialism and mm-hmm. how basically that completely transformed you know it created the modern context that we live in today right, right? So why were these innovations, I suppose, stifled everywhere else? What is what is your kind of take on that question? Um, I think a very big, uh, like a very big factor in this is just like pure chance. Uh, but one more big thing is, uh, as you, as you said, like calculus was invented three times around, like at like in, in different places before, like Newton did what he did for calculus. That's not exactly true. The new, how Newton created calculus and how those people talked about calculus is very different. Those people were like, oh, look at this particular problem. We can solve this problem by using this particular method, and that's it, right? And okay. that's yeah. what, whatever they said about calculus, right? Hmm. But what Newton did was basically said, oh, look at this tool. This Look at this new tool, which now hmm. you can use to solve all kinds of problems. Ah, okay, uh, okay. So, gotcha. So and uh, and sometimes, for example, uh, even, even like just not calculus, even more advanced calculus-based things. For example, uh, Taylor series or Maclaurian series were also invented uh, uh, invented at le- uh, in India sometimes, like independently. Uh, but those were again on, in a very special context that they were used, and that's and uh, that's how they were used. Secondly, uh, why didn't what, okay, whatever knowledge came about? Why didn't it spread like so much back in like antiquity as it did later on from europe i think and also said, how quickly because like it, it spread but it was slow and it was among like very small groups of people right you know what i mean right. but with, with europe it was just like this explosion if right. that makes sense right um i think well, what one big reason is again as, as i previously mentioned maybe the societal structure of each of those societies how how knowledge was basically spread uh spread across because we, we don't even know like even if the people like a common folk was had an access to all this knowledge that was going on back then, right? We don't even know that. Right, right. So, so, and back then, of course, world was very not not, not the co- communication around the world was not very was a not very an easy task, right? I mean, there was there was trade going on. There, like, there were routes going from Asia to Europe or like North Africa, like those like very flourishing civilizations. But it was again, it was it is first of all very dangerous and it was basically trade oriented. No one was not really want i mean again it's just a chance chance based thing but in in statistically speaking no one was really interested in 
transferring these kind of stuff, what their ideas rather than like physical goods from that which they can like right. or, or of the money. ideas right or right. of the ideas which are being transferred more like religious right. or spiritual because so on a so lot forth. of time when this this uh, massive uh, scale of like uh, of spread of ideas happen around the world in different periods of time for example in europe or before that during the islamic golden age uh in yeah. in, in, in baghdad, in baghdad it was because right? yeah. one of the major reason of that was because because of the patronage it got right because in a baghdad the caliphate gave this whole idea, this whole this whole in, endeavor of spreading knowledge and collecting knowledge, his own patronage. He paid for it. He 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 organized uh, those ex- special expeditions. He he made laws so that uh, so that they, these these things could information be information collected, right? right? He sponsored uh, like the House of Wisdom and all. Yeah, those, right? but, uh, the big fact was a patronage, but I don't think right. back then there was no no one was really patronizing mm. stuff like that, right? Mm. So there was no real motive to to spread all this kind of stuff. This was happening and no, and people who were responsible for spreading this kind of stuff were not really interested in spreading this but, kind of stuff. But even if you look at patronage, right? Because like, obviously like Islamic golden age was patronage, like the, the patrons were like the caliphate, right? And, and obviously Baghdad is, you know, the house of wisdom and the great library, right? And so on and so forth. And even if you look at something like before that, the Alexander the Great and the Greeks, right? The, mm-hmm. the great library of Alexandria, right? Mm-hmm. Another example of patronage, right? And pa- patronage was also in Europe, right? Obviously you have the Medici's uh-huh. and you have like the Northern Renaissance right? and so on and so forth, right? But like we see a patronage in these cultures as well. But like, why is it that then say, the, you know, the patronage of Baghdad or the patronage of Alexandria? Why didn't those, you know, those centers create these scientific revolutions or the industrial revolutions? I mean, granted, we still had industry, but not the same scale from the industrial revolution. Right? Uh-huh. But like, why, why didn't those like those intellectual revolutions take spread as fast and as, as widespread as they did during those period than they did, say, in Europe? Um, to be honest, I, I, I can't say for sure why it, it happened, because I think I think this is, again, a very big chance based thing that something some because the situation, the whole like environment is, is not like some kind of like a linear progression right of course right it's it's, yeah. it's 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 kind of a butterfly effect like even a right. small change a small idea a small action could change everything right yeah so exactly yeah so we don't i, I can't say because of that or uncertain big question mark big, big question mark of uncertainty what exact mm. actions lead to like the environment in europe that led to the spread of ideas right. or or development of ideas as it did as it didn't happen in those areas i don't know but we can to maybe talk about it in more like a more maybe scholarly way rather than what yeah, yeah. happened perhaps uh, i guess perhaps also there could be you know counters from bad ideas right like you know well, like you can have good ideas but you can also have bad ideas right because kind Europe, of working Europe, Europe, when, when, when this all things like what what we can like consider to be like scientific revolution happening in europe that was not a very good time for Europe. I mean, it was like indulged in what kind of like religious wars with Catholics and Protestants and like small kingdoms fighting with each other. And this all this was happening in between. Uh, so like sometimes even like, so uh, to, that was around the time when like royal houses, the kings and queens of like different kingdoms in Europe started to give patronage to science, their own patronage to science. For example, the Royal Society in England was was first uh, patron patroned by the Royal uh, British Monarch during Charles II, which was mm. uh, which was what like 1600s, right? Like, right, like yeah, the yeah. late 1600s. Mm-hmm. So that was around the time when like how like place like kings in like Germany or like Austria or England and even like in other like uh, in Italy or whatever, they started to give their patronage to like scientific endeavors and ideas. To all these scientists working, and due to some reason that this was also the time when our, our, the new great minds, what, what whom we like remember today, started to come up about, come, come about like Newton, Bernoulli, uh, like uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Hook. I don't exactly remember his hook, Man. and like yeah. Carl Linus or whatever. All these people started to come about. This was around the time, and because of the encouragement they got from the society around them, they worked on it and. And got preserved in in a more systematic way, uh, and 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 somehow due to pure chance, maybe this this structure held up rather than getting destroyed, mm. right? Like it uh, had so many times yeah, other civilizations, uh, right? Get held up, and since it got held up, 
period that subsequent generations, coming generations had access to whatever was already done and they built upon that. They didn't have to do any fresh start to to do it. And uh, and that basically led to, and other, uh, like, and coupled with uh, the other like socio-political environment of Europe back then, it led to like things like oh, yeah. industrial revolution and, right. and, and the good effects of industrial revolution and of course the adverse effects of industrial right. revolution. Right. So the printing press, <laughs> basically, it, is yeah. It led to yeah. both printing press and slavery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think I would argue, like at that point, like so with the printing press, right? Like I bet a lot of these ideas were able to spread quickly, probably because of the printing press, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that was yeah. And, and versus it, versus like the way it was being done in like India and the Middle East and and even in all of Europe, right? Where people are just hand copying these these ideas down. And because and what you can also argue, printing press in some like maybe more 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 pro or more you know, like not not as advanced maybe as Gutenberg's printing press, but in some like primary uh, form existing back in China, right? Yeah, the they, they block printing stuff, right, but they right, didn't the wood use block the, system. Yeah, they didn't use yeah. exactly this printing press in the same way how Europeans ended up using it to spread right. ideas. Right. Yeah. And so, okay, so right now then, do you think, are, are we in a period where I suppose like good ideas are, are spreading as efficiently as they, as they sh- can, or is it, or is it, you know, uh, or is, is there like a, I don't think there's a stagnation. I think there's obviously going to be a positive trend, but is it a positive trend, which is as efficient as it, as it can be? It's not as efficient as it can be. It could be certainly improved. I mean, we, I mean, a big factor or, or a big challenge right now in scientific research and scientific communication of those research is, of course, funding, because we right. can't do anything without money, Church. right? <laughs> and, 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 and funding yeah. is done by, mostly done by, I mean, government. I mean, of course, there are private uh, patrons, but the main patron in any country of, like, scientific research there is the government, right? Mm, and right. government is, again, politics. And politics, you know, is very bad. I mean, very bad <laughs> and very convoluted and right. very non-scientific thing. Do, um, do, you, do you think, then, are, are democracies good <laughs> places? Because, obviously, like, in a democracy where there's a lot more opinions, a lot more, you know, even distribution of power, right? Mm-hmm. Not, not completely, but, you know, to some extent there is, right? It means that, obviously, there's going to be more complexities, more convolutions. So do you think democracies are good places for sciences? Um it's it's good in the sense of law of averages, right? It's, okay. it's averagely good. I mean, it's it's the optimal thing we can get. It's not the best thing we can get. It's optimal because with the dictatorship or with an authoritarian regime, we always have we always have like cha- good chances that it could not happen, or a very good chance that it might happen. Because if it happens, then it might end up being something much better than any democracy could do ever, right? But then again, there's a very big question mark of what if it doesn't happen, right? But on average. Democracy, uh, democratic countries in long run and over like long, long air, like among uh, among a lot of peoples, would lead to something more positive. So it's I think it's optimal but not best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So what are you currently? I guess what are you most excited about within within you know because you're what in your final year now. So eventually you're going to be moving on to the, you know your postgraduates and and. Mm-hmm. Becoming more specified in in the fields, right in, right? in your field, right? So, what are you most like looking forward to uh, to studying within your field? Any ideas? Um, I'm 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 more 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 interested in because uh, as I, as I earlier mentioned that a lot of math came out of physics actually, like calculus yeah, yeah, came yeah. out of physics and a lot of other things came out of physics. In the same way, actually, uh, the first thing I mentioned is string theory has actually led a lot of new mathematics, a lot of new uh, exciting mathematics. And that's why, actually, string theory is more popular among the ma- mathematical circles these days rather than physics circles these days because it leads, because, because the prediction, the physical predictions that string theory makes and everything are like non testable and very like bizarre. While, while the mathematics, the new mathematics that is coming out of string theory is very like rich and interesting and something very new. So yeah, I'm, I'm basically like looking forward to looking and do, like going in that and the new exciting mathematics that is coming out of right. string theory and maybe so, how to reapply right. to like solve the challenges that string theory is like suffering through in physics, uh, in physics at least. Do you think you would be committing, I guess, a, a, in the field of physics, some sort of heresy by by going into string theory? 
Um, it depends on who you ask. A lot of physicists will say definitely <laughs> not. But it's, it's, the string theory is a part of physics which does not get as much recognition from physics community as it should. Because, I mean, if you look at string theories today, they're pretty, like, small group of people, pretty, like, yeah. obsolete and pretty, like, out of the community, in the mainstream community of physics. Uh, so they are kind of like, yeah, they're, they're like the social re rejects of the uh, <laughs> community, and they don't get recognition for any, I mean, most of the recognition they get is actually from the mathematical community, not the physics community. For example, the only physicist to win Fields Medal, the Fields Medal is like, it's actually, some people say it's an equivalent of Nobel Prize in mathematics, but I would say actually it's greater than Nobel Prize in mathematics because there are two conditions for getting a Fields Medal which Nobel Prize doesn't have. The first condition is that you should be less than 40 years old to receive it. And it's only given once in a, once in four years. Uh, uh, it's like a World Cup. Yeah. So, with, so, so and it's given for the remarkable work done in mathematics. So the only, only Fields medalist uh, who, is a, who is actually a physicist is actually a string theorist. And his name is, um, oh my God, I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, Edward Witten, sorry, yeah, Edward, Edward Witten. Gotcha. So, uh, right. So, so would you say then, like, so okay, so because string theory is so, like, I guess, so important, I guess, so useful for math, right? Like, is it? I suppose, like, would it would it be, I guess, better for you to to enter, like, if say someone is like starting out, right, and or by starting out, like, say someone is say in the same stage as you are, right, and and wants to study string theory, is it is it then better for them to try to like, um, I guess, try to to enter more the field of mathematics than say physics? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, that 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 is very true. Yeah, because for uh, if you look at my work at university, it's actually more mathematical work than physics work. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, of course, you, you study much more mathematics than you study actual physics when you have to say stuff like string theory. Yeah, but when you start your university, like because a lot of I've seen a lot of people when they come to university study things like physics, uh, at least they have expectation that they will start learning about black holes and gravitational waves in like in, the, in their first class. No, right. that's not going to happen. They'll you in your first at least your first not maybe in not maybe first two years but at least in your first year you will just do very boring why the ball rules kind of stuff um and so yeah don't come why does the ball that expectation because they have this expectation and when they come and do these classes these classes on like newtonian mechanics and everything they just could not do it they, they lose interest they don't do well in those classes so, and they basically like end up dropping so yeah study like think about think think carefully of what whatever you want to do look carefully research before you decide to go into anything don't don't ever take impulse decisions about anything mm. is is physics an attractive field do you think it's a, it depends on how you define attractive you're defining attractive as oh i'll i'll earn a lot of money from it and i'll i'll i'll, I'll have good job prospects and everything no it's not a very exciting field it's actually one of the fields you should run away if this is your mo motive. Uh, because, it, as I said, there's nothing very exciting in physics right going right now because most the most, the biggest questions which are open in, in physics right now are very, very, very advanced questions with very, very advanced tools and like research that is being done. So, like, it's either out of reach of a common person or uh, so, so yeah, uh, com common person, I mean, like common mind, you, you need to be some kind of brilliant person to like go and like even dip your feet in those kind of uh, works. Right, right. Uh, so, so yeah, so in that, in that sense, it's not a very attractive field, but if you are someone who is really, really interested in looking in this kind of stuff, like something which you read just, I mean, you, you, you think about all these kind of stuff in like, Korean sci-fi and like super superheroes comics and everything, and then you learn oh, there's actually possible in like maybe in a very theoretical framework, but just it being possible in a way like it's not something a total fantasy. It is possible that that that's just I mean, that gives like different level of excitement altogether. So it depends right. on what how you define like attractive. If you define right. attractive in that way, it's a very attractive field because you mm -hmm. end up you end up learning about it and you get opportunity to work on it. Well, if you had to find attractive in more like worldly ways, like money, status, uh, power, and 
and jobs and everything, then no, it's not very exciting to go to mm. business. <laughs> yeah, you heard it here first, folks. Do business. <laughs> no, but, yeah, uh, but I mean, like I you mean, know, I, I, I actually sometimes say that physics does its own natural selection. You know, principle of natural selection, right? <laughs> so. People either in their first and second year, it does it does its natural section. People who don't have the physics where just end, end up dropping or changing their majors, and mm. I've seen that happening. So yeah, physics is a very good like vetting, natural vetting going on in, in it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah it's interesting. Right? Is it is there a way to perhaps increase like the pool of people who are able to like go past that vetting process? Because like ultimately, right? Like if a field has more minds. Like you said, law of averages, they're probably mm-hmm. going to be able to figure out more stuff. They're going to be more productive. I mean, of course, right. there's, there there are programs to do, do outreach, uh, to do outreach uh, to people to uh, come more in this field. Um, especially there is there's a very concentrated uh, effort to out do outreach to like females because females are one of the most underrepresented communities in physics. Uh, um, so there's, of course, there's a there's a very strong effort to like increase uh, female participation in physics, um, and I'm, and I, I, and I'm happy to see the progress because I mean even though it's slow, slow and gradual, but it's happening. It's it's, it's trending positively. Uh, so yeah, of course, I would I would want to see more people coming in physics uh, because more people in physics is more research, and more people coming in physics, of course, is more jobs, right? I mean, right, <laughs> right. More, uh, more of a niche, right? A bigger yeah, niche, yeah. more bigger market, right? More so, bigger market, yeah. Exactly. So, so do you think there is someone as, say, brilliant or revolutionary as Karnath right now in in the world of physics right now? It could be anyone who you think mm-hmm. may have the same like ability as someone like Karnath or the same con- probably possibly the same consequential consequence. Actually. Uh... Yeah, like if you if you just compare like mind wise, like brain brain wise, their intelligence wise, I think there are a few people in in the world. But just but if you just if you want to look at their work, what they have contributed to physics right now, and what was and what's the consequence or influence of their work, it's not as influential as like maybe mm-hmm. how what Newton's theory of gravity was for physics back then, or even Einstein's theory of relativity was back then. It's a very high end work on something like. Like I mean, uh, I keep saying like string theory, for example. They work on it, but it's not very consequential in the sense that they mm. have changed the world from it. It's a very gotcha, gotcha. insight they have provided into certain problems. And uh, one name again I'm mentioning his name, which I think in this is in this in the same league as Edward Witten. Um the the guy who won the field medal uh, he he won the field Someone... medal for his work in physics actually. Oh, okay, okay. right. It's true. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look up I'll have to look him up. Yeah, I should look up CC. Yeah, What's up with him? I've learned an interesting slide about him. So my 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 physics advisor here at my university actually used to work with uh, Edward Witten, and 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 he said that he like he has a very like manly physique, like his body and face is very manly, but when he speaks, <laughs> his voice is like so low pitch, like he can like it has like a Mickey Mouse voice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it was wise for you to say now, because like next time he meets, if you if you ever meet him, you know, he might I mean, be like, "Is he, really my voice?" What are no. also, he's also good at taking jokes. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> physics people. That's, like, that's, that's like, what you physics, think. Physics, <laughs> physics people don't get offended very easily. Uh, interesting. I mean, interesting. And especially string theory people because they get kicked around a lot. <laughs> it takes. It's like it's a natural selection that mm. you talked about, right? They have learned to yep. game, so. Right, right. All right, I guess final question. So we talked about physics, we talked about history, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess a question which combines the two of them. Would you would you say that that so right now, right? So recently, we, I saw a tweet. Uh, I forgot by which organization, which was like "Happy Birthday to Isaac Newton, the uh, the father of physics." Right? Would you say right from you know your knowledge on history and physics? Would you say someone like say Karnad would be better suited for that title? Um. I probably would say Karnat might not be suitable as uh, as a candidate for like father of physics because uh, and 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 actually I would also say that a lot of people who have got father of dash 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 uh, right. in as a title uh, are probably not even suitable for their own titles. But I mm. think 
compared to Newton and Quran, Newton is more deserving as the title of father of physics than Quran. Because, of course, Quran gave some very insightful and very interesting and very uh, new insights. But what the word, the impact of work which Newton did in his own field and how it led to modern physics, like it basically it gave the direction to physics which it even has today. I would still teach what he what he wrote exactly in the way he wrote it. And 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 all our faces is based around what he told. So I think that that person is more deserving of title of father of physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he might be like a great name in physics. I would say yeah, he, he should be counted in like maybe like tenth first tenth first twenty or like top twenty physicists that ever lived or anything. But not the father because that is a very big title. Oh.